My name is Tom Gunderson. I uh, hack on Systemd. I've been doing that for the uh, last uh, five years or so, since the very beginning almost. And uh, I'll be talking about that today. So first of all, how many of you guys in the room use Linux on a day-to-day -day basis? Everyone, almost at least, yeah. Perfect. And how many of you know what Systemd is? Okay, not bad. Have any of you been following the so-called init wars? Okay, fantastic. Did anyone bring rotten fruit? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, just to have a... Okay, so... Um, how many of you use actually systemd today? So Arch Linux, Fedora, SUSE. So anyone using Debian? Okay. Not Jesse yet, so you'll have... Do you have systemd soon? And anyone using Ubuntu? You'll also have systemd soon, but not, not quite yet. Uh, what about Gentoo? No one here. No one, no again to. Okay, so all our current or future system users. Good to know. Okay, so first of all, I'll just talk a bit about what this system did project. Um, we started off um, roughly five or six years ago, 2009, started by Leonard Pettering and uh, uh, Kai Sievers. Uh, Leonard was at Red Hat at the time, and uh, uh, Kai was at SUSE. Um, they started out wanting to replace what was then uh, the main init system of the day, which was Upstart. Uh, it was uh, created by Scott James Remnant at Canonical, and people were slowly moving to that. Um, and, uh, but Kai and Lanach didn't quite agree with the direction that Upstart was going in, and they got together with Scott and tried to work together on improving it in the way they wanted. That didn't quite work out, mostly for... Um, Business reasons. So the the story with Upstart was that uh, it was um, you had to sign a what's it called contributor agreement. So basically, whenever you wanted to contribute code to Upstart, you had to give away your copyright to Canonical, and many people, including myself, would not want to do that. So I'm happy to make code on whatever open source license I don't mind, but I don't want to give away my copyright for free. Uh, so that didn't really work out, and that's why Systemd was started in 2010. And uh, 2009, sorry, and was uh, announced in 2010, and the first release was that. And shortly thereafter, people from basically all the major distributions joined. I was at the time the maintainer of init scripts in Arch Linux, and I joined before version one was released. My first contribution was to make it boot on Arch, um, so that was fun. And we had people from Debian, from Ubuntu, from Gentoo, and also people from Intel and Samsung and so on joining the project pretty, pretty early on. And nowadays, uh, as we already mentioned, it's been widely adopted across all the major distributions. I think Gentoo is the, the most famous uh, holdout, and Slackware as well. But everyone else are currently in the process of moving to Systemd. And uh, if you read the news, it looks like um, there's only one developer, Leonard Puttering, but in fact, it's not uh, really accurate. So last month, we had 50, 50 contributors uh, making 300 commits, and 50 of our, uh, 10 of the 50 contributors were new ones. So we are getting new people joining all the time. It's a pretty big community. And over the last one year, we had 5,000 commits contributed by 200 different people. And also, these, these people are mostly from big companies like Red Hat, uh, Intel, Canonical uh, a lot recently since they decided to join. They, we had, they've been contributing a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, other companies as well. But also lots of uh, independent uh, people and uh, hobbyists are, are helping out. So that's a bit about the project. And it started out as a, an, uh, an init uh, system wanting to replace the uh, PID one. Uh, but nowadays, it is, uh, has a much broader scope, and we now aim to be an uh, umbrella project to, uh, which should provide the basic building blocks for building an uh, open source uh, Linux distribution. Okay? So if you want to build uh, a server, or a mobile phone, or a laptop, or a fridge, or a robot, or whatever it is, uh, there are some basic things you need um, that is not related to your main business case, but it's some, the basic building blocks that needs to be on the, uh, underlying the whole thing. You need it, basically, all the time. And this is the stuff we want to provide. Okay? Uh, but as I said, it started out as an init daemon. And that's what I will start out talking about. What is an init system? And uh, where did we come from? And where are we now today with systemd? Before I start, any comments or questions? Okay. Just so you know, I, I have lots of... Uh, Slides with topics on them, and I haven't. Uh, I don't really mind changing the topic at all. So, if you have any questions or want to discuss something in particular, I would be very grateful if you interrupt me and we talk about something completely different from what I planned. It's much more fun. Okay. Um, so, 
in the beginning, there is PID1. When you boot your system uh, and the kernel starts, it spawns exactly one process. That's the first process, so it has process ID 1, and that is responsible for directly or indirectly starting everything else on your system. Um, and uh, once it has started your system, PID, PID 1 will stay around um, and wait for some system, change, system state to change. So typically, it will boot your system, wait around, at some point it shuts down the system and does the necessary steps to shut it down. Uh, that's a very, very high-level overview of what a init system or PID1 does. Until a few years ago, uh, basically everyone used the same init system, and that was called sysv init. It's been around for a long time, much longer than me, I think 40 years, uh, something like that. It's pretty small. I just looked through the code uh, two days ago before when preparing this talk. It's about 3,000 lines of code, and that's pretty tiny. Um, and uh, it has actually quite a bit of features that I, some of them you probably never used or never heard of. And um, as we mentioned, uh, a few years ago, people started moving away from sysv -Init. Some started using upstart. There was people using OpenRC. And uh, now, of course, as, as I said, most people use systemd. So but at its very core, sysv -Init and systemd does the same thing. So let's go back to the basics and talk a bit about sysv -Init, what it does, and then I'll show how why we needed to improve on that, and how we got to where we are today. Um, so, sysvinit, um, it has, uh, the only task is that it, uh, when, you, when you start your system, it will read a config file, which is called init tab, etc init tab. Anyone, everyone familiar with that? You've seen that before? Yeah. So, in, uh, in init tab, you have each line in the file uh, describes one process, and the important thing here, as you can see, it's, uh, it's the, um, I, I showed two example lines from uh, uh, Initab, from a standard uh, Linux Initab from years ago. The, from the second line here, it's uh, the binary, it's etsy getty, that starts your login thing. Uh, and the um, description of how it should be run is called respawn. So what it says there is that you should, when you boot the system, start a getty, and if the Getty stops for some reason, you respawn it. So you always have a Getty available. Uh, and uh, the first line on the slide here says it starts at uh, slash etsy slash rc. Um, and then it, the description of how it should be run is called boot wait. So what it does is that when you start a system, you, you start this um, at boot, you start etsy rc, and you wait around until it finishes. And once it quits, then you can proceed with boot and you start your Gettys and so on. Uh, so you can see that the main point, that there are many other uh, ways that you can describe how these things should work. So you have things like sysinit, which are the things that should happen very early in boot, and then you have boot, which should happen on boot, and then you have uh, control-alt-delete is a special keyword, which means that when, you, when someone presses control-alt-delete, that line should be invoked, and so on. The point here is really that you have a declarative syntax that describes what should be done without going into the implementation details. The implementation details are all done in the sysvinit daemon itself. So you don't, it's, uh, so this is where, it's not, like, it's not a bash script or anything like that, that that tells you exactly what steps to do what in. You just have a declarative syntax describing the behavior. Um, and as you can say, as you can see, the, uh, you only have one word to describe the behavior. You have boot wait, you have respawn, and a few other ones. But obviously this is very limited. You cannot express many complicated things here. You just have one word, yeah. Um, so, Let's see, yeah, and one of the main one one other limitation is that you can only describe what should happen at certain boot tran uh, system transitions. So we start a system or we shut down the system. You have you invoking these lines. We change the run level of the system. You invoking several lines, separate lines. But there's no way using pure sysvinit to say I want now to run this line. I want to restart my Getty. Something like that. You cannot interact directly with individual entries. Doesn't not possible. Uh, so actually, a long time ago, most distributions said, okay, init, uh, sysv init is fine, but it's too limited. We need something more powerful. Uh, and what they did was that they introduced something that they used to introduce init scripts, which solved many other problems with sysv init. So rather than sysv init, rather than configuring sysv init with each line describing all the processes you want running on your system, your web server or your X server and so on, uh, what you do instead is that you just have one line that invokes something called 
usually RC or Sysfin or Inscripts, and that will start all, this, all the processes on your system for you. And this is done now, rather than having a declarative syntax, now you move on to bash scripts. Uh, so they find a the case, the declarative syntax is too lim limiting, let's open it up so you can do whatever you want. So now what you do is that you start, uh, when you have your web server or whatever it is, you, uh, you invoke uh, uh, a bash script and that can contain anything at all. You can create files, delete files, set up namespaces, whatever you need. And then inside there you actually start your, your web server or, or whatever it is. Um, so that's nice, you have all the power now, but the bad thing is that it's now really difficult to know what actually is going on in your system. We talked about someone talking about Turing completeness, just uh, the last question here So in the, in the previous lecture. Is that now, the nice thing about Turing completeness, uh, as the, the guys mentioned, is that if you have something Turing complete like bash, then you can do anything at all. So anything that can be done in some other way, you can do with bash. The bad thing about it is that you have the thing called the halting problem. You cannot analyze a bash script with a machine and figure out what it will do. There's no, no way you can reason about it. It's just uh, some magic stuff and you hope it does the right thing. But in the old, I mean, if you go back to the original syntax, you had the declarative syntax, and then actually you knew very precisely what each, each line meant. It was too limiting, sure, but at least you knew exactly what would happen. So there was a trade-off there. Uh, so yeah, so uh, on the surface, most of the problems were solved, but there were still many remaining. So one of them is that in uh, SysVinit, the SysVinit, the SysVinit itself would start each of the processes. Now it started by uh, by a by a separate script. So if you start with SysVinit, calls RC, calls the, the script, that's all fine. You have a clean environment, and you know that the the parent the uh, the parentage sort of or the processes is all well defined and you don't get any, any mess in there. But one of the features that we wanted uh, in SysFinit that we only got with inner scripts is the ability to restart things manually so that you, you can interact with individual entries. You can log on as an administrator and you could restart your web server without having to reboot your system. And now you could do that, but the bad thing is that now you're not telling the init system to do it, you're doing it directly yourself, which means that whatever is in your environment as, your, as an administrator now could potentially leak into the web server itself. So it's no longer a clean environment. You no longer know the context you're starting things in. Obviously, um, the, the init scripts should make sure to clean up the environment before calling things uh, and starting a web server, but that would be down to each individual script to get that done right. And of course, most uh, get it wrong. Um, and that's another thing, is that um, now with the init scripts, you had, each init script had a lot of boilerplate code. So they all had basically doing the same things. Uh, it had an example, the example I show here, it deals with lock files. It makes sure that you don't start two instances of the same daemon twice by writing out a file and then deleting it when you restart it and so on. And it, this had to be done manually for each individual init scripts. And you have hundreds of them on a on normal distro. And each distribution did things differently, so there was lots of duplication of work. And when we started going through these things in the transition from uh, init scripts to systemd, uh, we found that a huge portion of these things were buggy or racy, uh, worked by accident or didn't work at all, and so on. So the, the thing of having this, all this boilerplate code that was re implemented over and over again actually turned out to be, uh, as not, was not very unexpected, was a real problem in, in real life. Another thing that we lost when moving from SysVinit was that uh, we no longer had any management of the daemons running of the services. We just started them. So if you start your web server and it crashes, no one knows, no one cares, there's nothing around. Until, unless you explicitly set it up yourself, there's no built-in support for checking that the processes are still running and, uh, or to react on crashes and so on. You would have to do that yourself in the inner script to have some sort of logic to, to watch the thing and then to restart it if necessary and so on. So this was something that SysVinit could do in this tiny 3,000 lines program. It, does it, it did it automatically, but uh, now that was thrown out um, and you would have to do it manually. And another thing is that, and this is the problem that was always existing, that we did, we, there's actually no built-in control over resources. So you start, a, you start a daemon, you start a server, and then even if you know you can stop it again by killing it, um, there's no guarantee that that hasn't forked off children that you have lost track of and that they are running now and doing things in your system. That's some, some runaway uh, child of your web server, some app or whatever, that some, one of your customers has written or something like that, is eating up all your resources and you don't actually know how, where is it? Who, who is responsible for this process eating all my resources? So that was 
that we never had. I mean, that we didn't get that with the NS scripts. It was all. I mean, it would be possible in Linux to implement some control over this, but most people didn't, or I don't think anyone did. Uh, so we didn't have it. And another problem that was always there was that there was no real handling of logging. So that each uh, usually when you have a daemon running, uh, it will output so the output some logs, either to syslog or to standard out or to standard error. And if you have a syslog daemon running and you write to syslog, you get the, the logs end up in syslog and that's all great. But if it's not running yet, maybe you start it early at boot or something like that, and you haven't yet started your syslog daemon, then you lose your logs. Or if you write to standard out, standard error, uh, usually the way that Inscript is implemented, people just drop this information on the floor. It was just lost. Uh, so there was no inbuilt management to make sure that all the output that came out of a daemon was somehow funneled somewhere correctly. There was, there was no, no control over this. And probably uh, something that wasn't a problem 40 years ago or even 20 years ago, but it suddenly became a problem 10 years ago, there was no support for dynamic event handling. So you plug in your USB stick or some hardware appears in your system and because boot had already finished, there was no one waiting around to handle the device that came. So say that you have in your F FS tab or something like that, you say that I want to mount my USB stick on this uh, directory, and when you boot the system, the USB stick isn't uh, plugged in yet, or it, it is plugged in, but the kernel hasn't found it yet, so, the, the, so you don't know about it. Then boot will just probably either fail, or it will just continue and ignore it, but later on when you when, when the thing eventually appears, there's nothing that cares about it anymore, and there's no way it will it will not magically just work. Um, yeah, and that was a uh, USB stick is one example, but uh, basically every piece of hardware on your system, even on a laptop where all the hardware is built into it, it's all dynamic. It means that you start your kernel and there's no hardware available, and it, it starts waiting for the hardware to appear, especially when the USB buses and also the PCI buses, I believe. Um, there's no notion of the bus finishing scanning for all the devices. So just that you never know when you have all your devices, when you, when you know about all the devices that are plugged in, they'll just appear at any time when they feel like it. Uh, so in such a world where things are dynamic, uh, we should have a init system that can actually deal with that. And sysvinit and init scripts could not. And the, the way people did that to handle it was to have like loops waiting so that if, if uh, USB disk is missing, wait one second, try again, wait one second, try again, after 15 seconds fail, and so on. And that's not very elegant in my, my humble opinion. Um, okay, so the situation when people had moved to init script rather than sysvinit was that we had this init system at the bottom, which was very basic and had lots of features, but none of the features were actually used. So it's a, pretty, it's a bit of a weird, weird situation that they had this very basic thing, but even though it's very basic, 90% of the features are unused. And on top of that, we had uh, so several layers of bash scripts trying to implement things that we actually needed, and as I tried to argue, uh, it actually didn't do the job very well. So something um, else uh, was needed, and we had upstart, as I talked about. I will not talk about that now, I think there's no time. Uh, but, uh, and then, uh, so the main, the main I think one of the main reasons for both Upstart and SystemD was to, to deal with the, the fact of the dynamic world we are in. So that the hardware might come and go at any time, and then things just snowball from there, the things that you have to deal with. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, of course, the, all the problems that I mentioned now, uh, we wanted to solve with SystemD. Uh, and since the very beginning, that has been one of the some of the, the, the core design principles. We want to go back to the good things about sysvinit uh, and keep the good things about um, init scripts and solve the outstanding problems. So we want to go away from uh, having to use uh, Turing complete language to specify how to start your daemons and back to having a declarative language where you can actually look at the simple configuration file and understand what's going to happen without uh, having to deal with, with complex logic. Um, and we will, yeah, and, and so on. So uh, let me just jump straight into it and uh, have a look at how you configure um, a daemon in systemd. So as uh, we said, in systemd you have one line, and the problem there is too, it's too limited. You can only you have only one keyword to describe the whole behavior of the daemon. So obviously, what we needed in systemd was to have something uh, a bit more uh, verbose. So in systemd, every um, daemon has its own configuration file, and the configuration file uh, describes the behavior. 
as I can't see it on the screen, I have to look here. So in this example, uh, we have an HTTP server. And the, the, you can see at the, at the top here, uh, you have awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks. OK. So you first have a unit section. So we have several kinds of what they call units, which describe different things in your system. This is a service, which is basically what you would call a, a daemon or a, a process. Uh, and so this is the, the most common thing. I'll, I'll just, I think I'll mostly talk about services uh, today. Um, so we have a description, which is obviously just used for uh, displaying to the user. And then um, we saw earlier we had things like boot weight or um, or uh, sys in it to describe when to start something. In um, we, we don't have such hard coded keywords in systemd. Rather, we you can explicitly say that um, you should only start this HTTP server after your remote file systems have been mounted and after your SQL database has also been started. So you explicitly say the things that you depend on. Uh, and moreover, we have something called requires, which is different from after. And the difference is that when you after is about what's time to do something. So that if something should be done, we can both say something should be done after or before something else. But it doesn't say um, what happens if the other thing is not around. What happens if the other thing fails? Uh, so you can have after uh, MySQL say, and you don't have MySQL uh, uh, on your system, and then it will just uh, ignore it. But if you say that you uh, requires sqldb.service, that means that not only will you wait for the, um, the the SQL database to start, but if it fails to start, or if it isn't installed, the whole thing will fail. So it will not try to start because it actually needs the database to be around. Um, and then it finally has uh, like a sanity check. So we said a cert path exists, and it, it checks that this, this SRV slash web server is actually around on your system. And if it isn't, the server service will will fail. And we have um, an equivalent thing here called instead of assert, it says condition. And that means that it will also check if the path exists. And if it doesn't exist, it will just not start the thing, but it will not fail. So it will silently just don't do it. So if it's not important, you have a condition. And if it is important, you uh, have an assert. Um, OK, and so these are just four examples. There are many, many, many th ways that you can configure the behavior of your basic units. Uh, all, all about, uh, sorry? Yes, uh, so in it was easy and incomplete, and now we are complete and it's more complicated. So the, the world is a scary and complicated place, sadly. Uh, so we have to have something more complicated to describe how it should work. That's the, yeah. Uh, well, so the, uh, so the, maybe in case people didn't, there's no, the, the the question was, or the comment was, that there's no control over the number of fields that get added. So the thing is that we have a lot of uh, different features in our unit files. And in order for us to be able to uh, provide what someone needs without actually resorting to a Turing complete language, we need to have a lot of features available uh, to us. And we, of course, the more features we add, the more complicated it gets. So we should be conservative when we can. But if there's a feature that people need, uh, we have to add it. The other, the other alternative would be that they have to make a, write a bash script that does the job, the same job that we do, but they, they just, you just call out from the uh, from the unit file into a bash script, and it can do all the, the logic they need. But obviously, the point of wanting a declarative syntax is that we want people to actually use it. So we want that basically 95% or 99% of all the things that you need to do on your system should be possible to be done with unit files, and then it needs to be pretty complete. And it's, it has a lot of features. You're absolutely right. And that's, of course, complicated to understand. But it's a much, e that's much easier to understand uh, a declarative feature like assert path exists than reading a bash script that does the same thing and checks that the path exists and uh, doesn't make mistakes with what if you haven't mounted the underlying mount point yet? What if, what if, what if? Okay. So that, that's pretty, co I mean, this sounds like a very simple thing. Check if that path exists and if it doesn't, then fail the service. But actually, there's it does entail a lot of things to get it absolutely right without no, with no race conditions and so on. So that would be my my defense to that comment. Um, OK, let me continue on a bit. Uh, so and this service, so the real point here is that when this service started, this XX start, it runs this binary. And uh, I think I will get back to most of the, the configuration later. I can just mention that uh, things like 
standard things that you could do in a bash script we can do here as well but here's just uh, yeah you just specify so you want to start this thing with a nice level of uh, five and you just say nice equals five and it does the right thing and we have a pretty cool feature I think it's called watchdog so that you know most laptops most computers these days come with a hardware a watchdog device in the, uh, on them and it, and the system never hooked it, hooked it up pretty nicely so that um, it will um, if your daemon supports it, the daemon can send a little ping to systemd every minute or so that you can configure it yourself. Uh, and then uh, you say in the service file that watchdog sec equals 90. So it means that if it's been 90 seconds have passed and it's not been a ping from the server, server then probably it got stuck, something happened, and systemd can restart it. So you have to, you have to enable it, of course, it's not uh, a default, but you can have this uh, watchdog support uh, hooked up. And then it goes all the way so that uh, systemd itself is a problem with that. It will um, use the hardware watchdog device, and uh, so if system itself gets stuck, then the whole machine will be rebooted, or can be. You have to enable it, as I said. Um, okay, and uh, the other things I'll get back to later. So I just the, the main thing I wanted to show here was uh, that the syntax is declarative. There's no programming going on here. There's no logic. Uh, you just declare what you want to do, uh, and rather than having just one line with one keyword to describe the behavior, we have many, many more options. As described. Any more questions? Okay. So the one controversial thing some years ago uh, that was added to the Linux kernel was C groups, control groups, and this is at the very core of systemd, and it is not optional, and it has caused some people to be annoyed that they we require you to enable C group on your system, otherwise we it doesn't work. Um, and I said something uh, in uh, talking about in the scripts that when you start a daemon, it can fork off processes and it's very easy to lose, lose track of them. So when you have a process and you have its parent, you can you can always you can always know the parent of a process. But if you have a process and its child and its grandchild and the thing in the middle dies, there's no longer a connection between the grandchild and the grandparent. Okay? So you don't know the relationship anymore. If you start one, if you start a web server and it has some children and it starts some grandchildren, the children dies and the grandchildren start misbehaving, you don't know who to blame, you don't know who to kill, and you are out of luck. Uh, with C groups, this changes. Changes. So the basic feature of C groups is uh, just the ability to um, group together processes on the on the system. So if you start a, if you start a process in a C group and it starts forking off other processes, no matter how it do, how it does it and no matter how how it kills its parent and so on, there's no way to escape the C group. I mean unless you uh, have the right uh, capabilities to actually um, explicitly escape C, group, C groups. But the point is that as a, a general demon, we started in the C group, its children and grandchildren and so on will always stay in the C group. Uh, and that means that when we can uh, say okay when you apply something to a when you apply some setting to a web server you don't only apply it to the to the main daemon you apply it to all the children and if you say okay something is wrong with my web server you can actually say okay all the all the all the uh, memory is being used by some great grandchild of this web server and now I want to kill it and then you can kill the web server and you can actually then kill uh, reliably kill all its uh, descendants and there's no there's no uh, Magic involved, no grepping of uh, process names or stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that was one of the basic problems we had before that you couldn't track processes in your system, and now we can with C groups, and that is uh, the essential. The the, uh, the way that we think of it in the system is that a service is just not it's not a daemon, it's uh, and it is a C group. So you have a, a C group containing a daemon and all its children, and that is the the um, the way you think of a of a service, and then you have optional features with C groups, which we don't require in systemd, which is but it which can be pretty useful, such as uh, control over CPU usage and memory usage and disk usage, I/O usage, networking, and so on. And the nice thing about it then is that when you apply a setting to the C group, it applies to all the children of it, and you can have sub C groups and so on, and you can split things out any way you want, uh, and you don't have to uh, worry about oh, what if it forks off and then something suddenly you, the the restrictions you put on one process doesn't apply to the children and and so on. Okay. Uh, next thing we had a problem was the next problem we had was logging, right? Another controversial topic. Um, the, as I said earlier, that in the normal in in back in the day in the sysvinit days, 
uh, you are not guaranteed to be able to capture all your logs. And moreover, even if you could capture all your logs, you, you are not guaranteed to be able to authoritatively say which exactly which process had logged the different lines. So if you have two web servers running on your system and they all have children each, and the children log something, figuring out exactly which like service, so which parent web server the logging uh, process belongs to, was not straightforward at all. Um, so what we did with systemd is that uh, when you start a uh, service, uh, all the by default, all the standard out, standard error, and syslog output from the service is captured and passed on to our logging daemon. Uh, so by default, all the output we log away. And uh, moreover, we attach a lot of metadata to the logging. And this metadata can be curated in a authority way. So you know that the metadata you look up is correct. In the, sys the standard syslog way of doing it, you have a, you just have text lines, so each entry in your log is a text line, and you will have to parse the line using grep or something like that and try and figure out uh, um, exactly what the, well, you know, what is the timestamp, what is the daemon, what is the PID that logged this thing, and then you, it's not really clear which, what of this information is something you can trust, and what, what of this information is something that the daemon that made the log could influence and mess with. And even if uh, no one messes with anything, figuring, figuring out exactly where, where it belongs, um, apart from the PID, was not straightforward at all. So now we have that. So we have, we, con uh, we collect the logs like before, so the same text output as before, but we add a lot of meta information to it. So we add which service, service um, logged this line, at which boot, so every time you boot, we have a, like, a counter that uh, keeps track, track of the different boots, so you can say, give me all the output of Apache from uh, last Thursday, and it will give you all the output from Apache last Thursday and all its children, and so on. Uh, or you can say, give me a, the output of Apache from this boot, or from the last boot, or from three boots ago, and you can get exactly this kind of information. And you can also say things like, uh, give me all the output from last Thursday that relates to my hard drive, hard drive because something went wrong with it then. And it, it has its meta information, and it can cure it. And I, I could, I should probably um, mention that because that's the, uh, I said it's controversial, and the reason that the logging we do is controversial is because before you, you logged everything in a plain text file, and now because we have meta information and we want to be able to query things efficiently, we no longer have a li lin linear uh, text file, but we have a binary file, which means that the, uh, when you open the, the file in like Vim or whatever, that if you open the, the log in Vim, you can still see your text line, but there's also some garbage in between, and the garbage is the metadata. Uh, and one nice thing is that when you, because of the way that our logs are laid out on disk, you can actually uh, quickly search them doing a bisection. So if you want to find a particular date, you don't have to go through you know, four gigabytes of logs. You, you just use a bisection and you find exactly you go two weeks back in time, and then you go one week back in time, and then you go one and a half week back in time, and so on, and you find exactly the right timestamp without having to scan the whole log. So a lot of operations that used to be linear in time are now um, log n in time. Um, so yeah, that's pretty nice. But people uh, don't like the fact that uh, the, um, the standard tools of accessing the logs are doesn't really work. So if you open, open something in Vim, you see lots of garbage you don't want. Uh, and people are uh, uncomfortable with that. Yeah? Saving, uh, it shouldn't, uh, it's the same amount of, oh sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, does the storing of the logs in binary form um, um, uh, save space? And uh, my answer is it shouldn't. I mean, we, we don't aim to save space because the amount of information is actually is bigger. So we store the text logs plus more information. Uh, but what we could uh, hope to achieve is to be more efficient at retrieving the information. So rather than having to wait for, for five minutes to scan some huge log, you only wait for 10 seconds because rather than being linear, it's, it's logarithmic. Um, we have a mic. You can repeat the question yeah. quickly. And I get my exercise. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so the question was, um, if you could perhaps store the data more efficiently because you can store stuff like timestamps and PIDs in an efficient binary format. The messages, oh, yeah. of course, will always take the same space. Yeah. Um, 
So I must admit I don't have the binary format in my brain, so I don't remember if it's. I think when we did it for the uh, similar things we done for the kernel, so the, the raw output from the kernel, and the uh, it was no, it was roughly the same amount of space it took to to save the information. Uh, but I think because we save a lot of more a lot more information, you will lose some space. But uh, to remedy that, we do support inline uh, compression of the logs. And the reason for that is that obviously most of the time the logs are, are tiny; they're just a small line. But you can have huge amounts, huge blobs of stuff logged away. So if you're if your um, something crashes, you can uh, optionally, of course, but you, you can uh, log away the core dump into your journal, and you can retrieve it. And so you can have big, big pieces of, of data in the logs, and uh, we now uh, support compressing them. So in principle, we could save some space there. I haven't really studied this though, so I, I must admit I don't, I'm just telling you what I know. But I am probably worth looking at. Maybe we can make do something better. We have another question here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, do you have command line tools that present the logs in the sort of old way, so yeah. you can process them with the same tools as always? Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. So the so the the criticism before was that when you you would just do cat and then your log and you would get it out in plain text. Now you do journal CTL and then you would get exactly the same like pixel perfect the same output. Uh, but then of course the and with the possibility of adding, sending more uh, command line options to journal CTL to get more, either more filtering or more output or, or whatever you want. Um, yeah, I can I could talk on about logging for forever, but let's uh, let's move on. Um, oh yeah, events. I I mentioned earlier that you never know when the kernel. And hence, when your init system knows all the available uh, devices on your system, and uh, so to deal with this, so how it used to work uh, back in the day. So set up when you boot the system. One of the things you want to do is to mount all your local file systems, and then you want to continue booting. Uh, so what it would do, it would um, it would wait for all the hardware on the system to hopefully be uh, available, and we had a, a a way to sort of settle the machine. But uh, it never really worked, and it was always known that it didn't really work because it's just physically impossible. It just that's just the way that say the USB standard is defined. It can't really work. There's never a point in time where you know that you have everything available. So what we did was that we had some hacks in place, some timeouts, and so on. And then at this point, we assume everything is available. Uh, the bad thing about that was that not only did you wait for the disks that you actually cared about, you waited for all the hardware on your whole system to be available and then you would uh, proceed to, to do whatever you needed to do next. And the next step would then be to, to, to do file system checking of each of the hard drives. And then once all that was finished, it would go and mount each hard drive in turn. And I said, if something was not there, if it wasn't ready, uh, it would just either fail the boot uh, or usually just limp along and hope for the best. And it would never handle it later. So nowadays, we do it completely differently. We say, OK, I want to mount my home directory. And I want to mount my uh, slash user directory. And I want to pronounce my, my, my boot directory. And it's OK. In order to mount each of these things, it needs the file system checker. So it waits for the file system checker to finish. And in order for the file system checker to to finish, it needs actually the hardware to appear. So it waits. So it uh, has a dependency on the hardware to arrive. And as soon as the hardware arrives, file system checker starts on each of the individual disks, and uh, then when that's finished, you go ahead and mount the thing. Um, but you never have a thing that you are waiting for. All the hardware to appear, all the file system to finish, and then mount all the disks. They, these things happen completely in parallel, completely independent of each other. And you could start things in the background. So if you, if your web server is not uh, doesn't need your home directory, there's no need for the web server to wait for home directory to be ready before it starts up and so on. So this uh, is no longer this, uh, this um, what's it called, um, strict separation of different tasks happening different times. Things happen when they are needed uh, and not before. Uh, OK, so that was one of the big problems that was solved when moving to either Upstart or Systemd. We solved them in different ways, but the, the, um, the aim was basically the same. Um, yeah. And uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so one thing. So the events. One kind of events that we have on our system is um, um, is hardware appearing. Another one is files changing. So you can say that. Imagine that you have uh, a cups. 
server and you want it to start whenever someone uh, drops a job in your in your spool. So I have a directory in var slash spool or something like that. And you could uh, actually watch the directory for changes of a new files appearing and then you can react on these new files. So there are other also other kinds of event sources we are listening to and you, you react ac accordingly. Um, okay, and very much related to events, there was the, this, the notion of um, activation. So when do you start something? So you start a service. So when you boot your machine, there's usually there's one set of services that you want started, and they start as soon as they, uh, as, as they can. Uh, but then there are other kinds of services that you probably don't really need. Like I mentioned uh, cups, printers, the printer daemon. Most of the time you don't print, I mean, I print like every third week, right? I don't need my laptop to have a printer daemon running all the time. Uh, and uh, other things, you have like your, uh, maybe your modem manager. So I use a modem on my machine every once a month or something like that because when I'm outside and I can't use my Wi-Fi. But usually I don't care about it. I don't need it. Um, and so on and so forth. There are many, many things where you usually don't need it, but when you need it, you want it to be available. And for that, we have different ways of activating a service on demand. So um, one way is to have what we call socket activation. So you, if the way to communicate with a daemon is via a socket in your file system. Rather than starting the daemon and then installing the socket and waiting around for the, the thing to someone to ac access it, uh, the init system itself installs a socket and listens on it. And as soon as someone tries to access the socket or try to send a, a request on the socket, then and only then it starts the daemon and passes on the request directly to the, the daemon without ever losing anything in, in between. So it means that if Cups or whatever has a socket interface to it. I can just start a socket, which takes you know one millisecond, but I don't have to actually start the whole daemon, which takes lots of resources, lots of time, and waste yeah waste my time. Um, and then every third week, when I want to print something, um, I never even notice the fact that Cups wasn't running all the time. It will just start automatically and handle the job. Uh, another another way uh, another activation source is uh, using auto mounts uh, so for instance uh, you have on your your machine you have slash boot which on many systems these days is a fat partition and uh, because uh, the EFI standard uh, requires or it guarantees to always work nicely with fat partitions so many of uh, many distributions always use fat just to be the most compatible with everything like uh, Mac OS and, and Windows and so on for your boot partition and uh, the bad thing about fat is that apart from all the many, many bad things about that. But the one bad thing about it is that the file system drivers in Linux really, really suck. So the chances of your fat partition getting garbled and hence your machine unbootable uh, if it's running, if it's mounted all the time, is pretty high. So probably what you want to do is that to make sure that the, the, your boot partition is only mounted when you need it. And for this, we have what we call auto mount unit. So, auto mount is a feature of the Linux kernel that you could always use, but we have hooked it up pretty nicely so that you can uh, just mark a uh, file system to be auto mounted, which means that um, when you boot your machine, it's not mounted, but when you actually access the file system, we mount it, we, files, we do the file system checker, then we mount it, and then you never even notice that it wasn't there all the time. And after some time, when you are when you haven't accessed it for some time, it will unmount it again. So, you, don't, so you reduce the risk greatly of uncleanly uh, unmounting your fat, fat, fat file system and hence, hence making your machine unbootable. So that was auto mounting. And lastly, I mentioned things like modem manager. So modem manager, when you want to interact with that, you do that via Dbus. Everyone know what Dbus is? Yeah, okay, cool. So that, this is the, like the, the IPC system that most Linux uh, desktop environment uses these days. And if you want to speak to the modem manager, you want to tell it, uh, please, you know, connect my modem, you use uh, the Dbus to, as a way of communication. So it's like a socket, but, it, you know, it's, it's not, not precisely. Um, you, send, you send requests over Dbus um, to, do, to make it do the thing it wants. And uh, you can do the same there with sockets, as with sockets. Rather than uh, starting the daemon and the daemon then uh, grabbing a name on, the D, on Dbus, um, PID1 will grab the name for it, and as soon as someone uh, act, accesses the name, we will uh, start a daemon, and you didn't, you never noticed it wasn't running all along. So that's pretty nice when you are, um, uh, when, when you have some daemon that takes resources and you n almost never uses it. Uh, another nice thing which we will get more of uh, in the future is the possibility of uh, having exit on idle, which means that when you have your 
printer demon or whatever it is, noticing that, okay, I was used, but there's no need for me to stay around, just wait three more weeks to be used again. So after some time, it can shut itself down, and just, uh, but it will leave the socket in place. And it will do this in such a way that you can never, ever lose any requests. You don't have a race condition that, what if I tried to print something at the precise time that I was shutting down the printer demon, and suddenly my print job got lost. That uh, we have, uh, very soon we'll have a way to do this uh, so that uh, you are always guaranteed to never lose anything. Okay, uh, so those are ways of activating stuff. Uh, any questions? Okay, I'll move on. Uh, so we talked a lot. Uh, I talked a lot in the beginning about dependencies that things have. Uh, okay, things need to start before other things. So you need to uh, start uh, in the mount your file system before you start your web server or whatever it is, and. Uh, one nice thing about these ways of socket activation, DBus activation, or mount activation is that you can um, you can ignore a lot of dependencies that used to before needed need to be made explicit. So say that you have something that depends on your model manager running. Uh, it used to be that you had to explicitly configure, that, okay, before I can use this thing, I must start model manager and so on. And now we can drop that because in the cases where you have socket activation or DBus activation, you set up the communication channels first. You set up the DBus name, you set up the socket first in the file system before anything else is done, and you guarantee that it all is always available. So the order in which you start the demons is irrelevant because they will, uh, the, the, the process, the PID one will sort these things out for us. Okay. I think I have not so much time left, I have about five minutes, so I will not talk too much about status notification. I will just mention that in the, back in the day when you started a daemon, it needed to tell PID1 that it was ready. So when you're ordering things one after the other, you need to say, okay, it's not enough just to, to tell the printer daemon to start, you have to wait for it to actually have uh, set up all its um, uh, communication channels, and then it's ready, and then you can use it. Uh, the way it used to work is that you would it was a complicated mechanism where you would fork twice and then you would kill the, the middle parent and then the grandparent would tell PID1 that now we are ready. It was something like that. It was, it, was, it was fine, but it was pretty tricky and a lot, a lot of demons got it wrong. So that it was, uh, they didn't follow the precise protocol that they were supposed to and every demon had to implement it correctly or things would be racing. So they would indicate they were ready before they were. Uh, and um, so in systemd, uh, because, well, mainly because of uh, the different ways of activation and so on, we no longer need um, to do these tricks with uh, with the double forking and so on, and the way that demons notify, notify the PID1 that they are ready are much, much simplified and uh, much less chance of messing things up. We still, of course, support the old ways, but we can now do new ways too. Um, sandboxing, so a nice thing, uh, obviously you want your system to be secure. And the Linux kernel and user space has a lot of features that allow you to, to secure your stuff or lock down your stuff in many, very, many different ways. But they are, many of them are complicated, they are unintuitive, and there are many different tools you have to use in order to actually set up things correctly. So in systemd, the, what, one of the things we want to do is to make it simple to do the right thing. So you want to make it simple to make secure demons. And the way you do that is by saying, okay, if I have some service that never should access the network, I can put private network equals yes in my unit file, and systemd will make sure that there's no way that this daemon can access the network. Or if this will, doesn't need access to raw hardware, I can say private devices equals yes, and so on. If, I, if this daemon doesn't need to write to slash user or slash etsy or slash boot, like most daemons don't need to do that, then you can say protect system equals full, and you're fine. Same if you don't. If the daemon doesn't need to write to home, I mean your web server usually doesn't need write access to home. You can say protect home equals read only, or protect home equals yes if you don't want to show it at all, and so on. You can also uh, filter out system calls, so you know that the daemon is not supposed to, to use certain system calls. You can filter them out, um, and there are many other many other security features that come out of the box, and you just put one line in your unit file, and you and it just works. Okay, so I have. Couple minutes and um, one minute, and um, so that was the init system, and that was how system this started. Uh, but the thing is that when you when you have your init system and when you have booted your machine, that's all well, but you need to do something else. I mean, uh, that doesn't give you near uh, just having PID one doesn't give you give you very much. So what we found is that okay, in order to have a basically useful system that a lot of other components that everyone needs, 
and that's not very many people interested in working on because they are, you know, there's not very glamorous stuff like creating files or cleaning up files, uh, handling device events and so on. Uh, so what we thought, okay, so systemd in order to be useful, uh, something that people can build stuff on top of, should come with the basic building blocks needed to have a useful uh, system. So one thing we do, like we have a component called temp files, which uh, clean up files after you. You have something called loca locale D, which deals with um, your, your language settings and so on, and uh, exposes this over uh, Dbus so that uh, like GNOME or KDE or whatever can interact with this in a nice way without having to parse config files. It's the same thing for the host name, so that you can set and change the host name nicely. I mentioned already the journal, which is used for logging. Uh, I didn't mention, but there's something called UDEVD, which is the, the daemon that uh, listens for all hardware events and processes this nicely, attaches information to it, and passes it on to the rest of the user space so that we can yeah, uh, deal with hardware appearing on runtime. And there are many other things that I will not have time to get into. Um, but if you have any questions later on with particular things, I will be very happy to answer them. And for the future, a very big debate at the moment going on on the Linux kernel mailing list is KDBus, and this is going to be awesome, and uh, I'm looking very much forward to it. We want to move the, KD, uh, the DBus daemon from user space into the kernel for many technical reasons, but, one, but mainly the, there are many race conditions at the moment. There are many bugs that we cannot solve in user space, and once we get into the kernel, we can start using DBus in places that couldn't be used before, including uh, early in the boot uh, and for many new use cases. So I'm um, and I'm I need that for my own work and I'm looking very much forward to it. So I think I will that's this one thing about the future. I think I will stop there and thank you so much for your attention. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you Tom. I think while we're out of time we still uh can take one or two questions. I'm personally very happy to uh, hear about Systemd a bit. I have it on my personal to do to write a service, so maybe I'll pick your brain about it. Sure. Um, for uh, writing a continuous integration system, which should, of course, always be running. But yeah, that's besides the point. Let I have a question. Um, one of the reasons for Inedy to be small Thank you. is that it's very critical. So you cannot start your system if there's a bug in NAD. And uh, uh, how is uh, systemd protected against uh, not starting your system because there's a bug in it? Uh, so systemd doesn't have bugs. That's one of our nice things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, of course you are right that the bigger your the, the bigger uh, the stuff that you're working on, the the more likely it is to have bugs. But it, so the thing is that system in it itself is tiny, as I said. But it doesn't do anything useful. So before you can actually get to your system, you need to have uh, your init scripts. And in order to have your init scripts, you need to have bash. And you need to have all these tools. So there are a number of lines of code that's actually running on the system to make a useful system. It's probably much bigger on the old system compared to the new system. Uh, because now we have, well, we have PID1, which it takes all the important things, the, all the things that if they fail, your machine is host. It, that's what we do that. Uh, and anything that is not essential, we try to keep out of it. And the big debate, of course, is what is essential and what isn't. Okay, we can argue about that. But um, I think that having a tiny sys uh, PID one, just for the sake of having a tiny one, and then moving the important things out of it, which if they break, it will anyway break the whole system, it doesn't really gain you anything, in my, in my opinion. And, uh, but I think that for, uh, for the sake of stability and um, robustness, a much more important thing is that we made it much easier to, re to replace the init scripts which were written by people who didn't really know the, the how to say it, by amateurs such as myself in my old life. I would write init scripts for demons I didn't really know about. I would say, okay, I need Apache for Arch, I used to work for Arch Linux. I need Apache for Arch Linux. I will write um, an init script to deal with it. It was this long and I didn't really know the terms of Apache very well. Uh, so that was probably, I probably shouldn't be doing that. And um, the system still starts. <laughs> and, uh, and so it does with, uh, with systemd. No. So we are, of, if, if of course. Apache, if Apache is not starting, your whole system is still starting. Well, if you have a web server, it doesn't matter. If the whole point of it is... Oh, well, you, you need to get, get into do repairs. So that's... Uh... Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I think as an overall, if you look at the overall system, we have a much more robust system now than we 
had before because we can move the hard work into either the init system or into the daemons themselves. And the integration work done by the distributions is now become from really hard, it's become trivial. So that I think is a benefit. But we can fight over a beer maybe. All right, yeah. I think this is a classical case of you agree to disagree. And uh, we're sadly out of time. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Tom. Thank you very much.